Yes, you can start. I would like to blissfully take this opportunity to wish the last good morning to the online congregation attending IPWGSP 2021. As you all know, today is the final day or day 11 of this marvelous Harswell lecture series. I am filled with supreme delight as well as a bit emotional too. However, in the bigger frame, I am highly content with the success, risk, and impact of IPWGSP 2021. The attendees have been the heart and soul of this virtual workshop, and I thank every single one of you for registering with us and being openly present throughout the lecture series. I would like to reiterate that it has been a fascinating journey of knowledge sharing and integration from the finest mind of the world. To commemorate the final day of IVWGSP 2021, we have arranged this very short military function. May I welcome the honorable dignitaries to the digital dice, please. Honorable Chairperson, Dr. G. Norhari Sasti, the Director of CSR and East Jorhat. Chief Guest of this function, Dr. Andrew J. Michael, USGS USA. Guest of Honor, Professor Dafeng Zhao from Tohoku University, Japan. Special Guest, Professor J. R. Kyle, Deputy Director General of GSI. And Dr. Saurabh Borwa, Chief Scientist of CSR and East Jorhat. Keynote Speaker for Final Session, Dr. Sarah Minson, USGS USA. Now, may I request our Honorable Director, Dr. G. Norhari Sastri to present the military speech. Over to Professor Sastri, sir. Very good morning and thank you, Shantanu. And I must really congratulate you and your team for conducting this international virtual workshop on global seismology and tectonics and doing it for the second time during the COVID pandemic. Under the able mentorship and leadership of uh, Professor Andrew J. Michael, who has played a very important role in formulating this concept along with our team at NIST, as well as Professor Dafeng Zhao and Professor Kayal. And I also should thank Professor Saro Borwa, who is the senior most member in the geoscience division and then guiding Shantanu and the team from time to time. And uh, today's speaker, Dr. Sarah Minson, who was also actively involved in this uh, international virtual workshop. I would like to tell that when we conducted this last year, there were about a thousand people from 25 countries, which was a remarkable achievement we felt at that particular point of time. But when we try to repeat it this year, we had 1,800 participants from 42 countries. So it is a spectacular achievement in terms of numbers, but more importantly, in terms of the spirit, I feel that this Northeast region of India is a region which has boundaries with more than five countries, Bangladesh, China, Myanmar, Bhutan, and Nepal, and is a strategically a very, very important place in the whole world. And I would be very, very happy, COVID permitting and all other things, we would like to have you in person for the third workshop let that be a workshop of global seismology and tectonics, not virtual, but offline. And I must uh, thank our Honorable Director General, Dr. Shekhar Mande, for giving us permission, because when we conduct international workshops, we have to get the clearance for Ministry of External Affairs. This is good, because our Ministry of External Affairs have noted down that this very important e event has taken place and we would trigger the scientific temper in this area through this and with the help of all of you particularly i must thank professor andrew michael professor tapang jao professor kayal professor saroburwa professor sara minson and a number of people from in the different institutes who gave the talk and I'm delighted to see the names and the content. Several talks I was trying to attend 
offline, uh, online, but I was not able to participate because in the last 10 days, I have been traveling to a large number of places right from the northeast to the far north, which is Leh Ladakh, which is bordering in China in the north. But when I come back and then get the feedback about this international workshop on global seismology and tectonics, I'm very, very delighted to have it. And we would definitely continue to work with the international community and see how we can get more value addition in understanding the seismology and tectonics in this very, very important area in particular, but in globally in general. And I thank uh, all the organizers and uh, particularly Shantanu and Dr. Manoj Pukkan and Dr. Saurabharva for giving me this opportunity. And I wish that this particular series of workshops will trigger the scientific collaborations and also friendship. And definitely, this is something that we remember uh, throughout our life that I feel that during this COVID pandemic, these two international workshops on global seismology and tectonics have played a very important role in keeping us motivated, both young people and not so young people. Thank you very much and Jai Hind. Thank you, sir, for your motivating speech. Now, proceeding the validity function, may I again request our honorable director, Dr. G. Narhari Sastri, to unveil the EFSTRAC volume of IPWGST 2021 and also share his remarks about the volume. Over to Professor G. Narhari Sastri, sir. So you're able to see this? Yes, sir. So I'm very pleased to unveil the e-abstract volume. E-abstract uh, volume of IVWGST 2021. It features a compilation of 22 session abstracts by all the keynote speakers. Apart from 42 abstracts submitted by the participants, encompassing several interesting topics of geology and geophysics. The session abstracts can immediately aid in further elucidating and recalling the discussed theories and practices during the course of IVWGSC 2021. The abstract volume would serve as a medium of propagation of research erudition across global geoscience forums. I thank all the contributors who have submitted an abstract for the volumes. Besides, I am also very pleased to announce that the abstract volume also includes a monograph of GSTD. And I believe that this is the first of its kind holistic publication of the departmental activities of our Geoscience and Technology Division of CSAR, Northeast India Institute for Science and Technology. I have seen that it carries a record from the very nascent stage of the division to the present day and lots of efforts were involved. And I also am very thankful to the illustrious speakers from all over the world who came and taken their time to discuss about various aspects. And I'm very, very thankful to all of them and particularly in India, the who is who in the earth sciences and seismology have participated. And what is very nice is to see a number of young people who have sub submitted their abstracts and also have actually participated in these deliberations. And I'm sure that this particular compilation, which is very nicely documented, I could see, and as probably some of you can see, 
that it has a slightly different way of uh, presenting the people and i am sure that most of us as human beings the best delight that we have is to see our own photograph in a book of abstracts and particularly the young people will be very happy to see this and i must congratulate the organizing team shantanu burua manoj pukan and all of south serb and all of them for their excellent work and thank you very much this is very nice thank you sir for your kind remarks the year stack volume will be shared to to our dignitaries as well as to the online attendees through email and also it will be available in our nest website thank you very much now may i request our chief guest dr andrew j michael from usgs usa to say a few words on ipwgst 2021 over to professor andrew thank you for time so, so first of all i want to talk about the abstract volume which um i see is actually even more spectacular now in its final form than in the the draft i was reading through today and um first of all it contains um the names and photographs of all of the many people who put on this amazing workshop um and that all need our thanks and i really am appreciative of the effort that goes into this you know starting from dr sastry and the institute sponsoring it and shantanu but really a very large team of people that is in there um now i just have the abstracts of the others but now i am also very excited to see the photographs of the people and attendees who submitted their 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 work i i enjoyed paging through the abstracts and looking at the topics today um but in the, especially in this time when we're separated the ability to see everyone's faces is 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 really nice and i also appreciated the monograph that um was added this year to learn more about the geoscience and technology division to see their facilities both at the um at their office center and also out in the field their field ins installations i i i know a lot of work had to go into producing this volume and i want you to know that i have been reading it and i look forward to reading it some more and i think the reason i really appreciate this the effort that goes into this is because first of all when I give a talk. Um I know that I always learn a lot. I learn a lot from getting to prepare the talk, from having to explain my thinking in a new way. And for instance, last year when I talked about the Poisson process, I now really understand the derivation of the Poisson distribution in a way I never did before. And I appreciate the ability to share um what I've been working on and what I'm thinking about with others and I think the, the fact that the fact that people appreciate that opportunity is shown by the fact that every single colleague i asked and were suggested and then chantano invited um said yes including including sarah to to come and spend some time sharing and then i think really with this abstract volume and then the fact that the videos are online afterwards um means that this is not just a one time thing it's really lasting i i i was very pleased i looked earlier today and saw that some of the youtube videos of lectures from last year have hundreds of views and i know that i have also been very busy during this last couple of weeks and have had trouble um attending some of the lectures i had conflicts with some of them and i look forward to 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 watching quite a few of them in the future and it even impacted my own work this year um i had a very wonderful um undergraduate student as an intern this summer and there was a point where i said well you really need to learn a little bit about aftershock forecasting So please watch Nicholas Vanderell's talk from last year's conference and because here we have a good um summary talk and and then the Poisson process was a little interesting so I asked him to watch one of my talks also but I I think this is really a valuable resource to to put together this comprehensive set of lectures that spans such a wide range of global seismology and tectonics so I I am grateful on many many levels and I look forward to the third installation of this wonderful endeavor thank you thank you thank you sir for your uh, nice comments uh, now may i request our special uh, guest of honor professor dapeng jao from pohopo university japan 
for his remarks. Over to Professor Dapping Zhou. Okay, thank you, Sandino. In the past 10 days, I have really enjoyed this uh, international workshop. And uh, I have tried to listen to most of the lectures. And I think that all the lectures I attended are really excellent and uh, very informative. I uh, have learned a lot from uh, these lectures and uh, including the in and uh, advanced studies of the seismicity and the mechanism of the large and great earthquakes in the Himalaya region and uh, seismic hazard assessment and reduction, uh, ground motions and uh, state of the art uh, seismological techniques, etc. And the reported materials will be very useful to my and my group's studies from now. And I really uh, would like to uh, express my deep uh, gratitude to all members of the organizing committee of this uh, workshop. Thank you so much. You have really done a very excellent job and a very important work by organizing this uh, uh, international workshop. It is a really a great contribution to the development of the global seismology and the tectonics. I think this uh, second uh, international virtual workshop is very successful. Sincerely, uh, congratulations. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for sharing your experience with us. Now, may I request our special guest, Professor Zia Kyle from our Deputy Director General of DSI, to say a few words. About to Professor Zia Kyle, sir. Thank you, Shantanu. Thank you so much. Good morning and good evening to you all, depending on your geographical position of attending this workshop. I would say that this Global Seismology and Seismotectonics International Workshop has been one of the outstanding international workshops I have ever attended. Sitting at home, we, are, we have learned so much. And the deliberations were given by all scholars, authorities, and experts across the globe. We thoroughly enjoyed this. Not only enjoyed, we learned a lot from this workshop. We have not only discussed the earthquakes, but we have also discussed in great extent the passive, not only passive seismology like earthquakes, but also active seismology to understand crustal structure deep interior of the earth by seismic tomography and uh, receiver function, understanding active faults, seismotectonics of the regions, so on and so forth including seismic hazard, microzonation, precursor studies, you know, uh, crustal deformation, volcanology. I think we have not, you know, missed any aspect of solid earth geophysics. And it was really very really enjoyable because the, as a, you know, the honor I was given to chair the sessions, I did not leave us for a second, literally in this, this chair, and try to thoroughly enjoy each and every lecture, each and every word of it. Our So this workshop has not only educated us, means not only educated our young scientists and students, but we all of us, as Professor Zhao has told, we all of us have learned a lot through this workshop. Our deep gratitude on behalf of the organizing committee, on behalf of the all faculties and participants, I must convey our deep gratitude and sincere thanks to the director, Dr. Narahori Sastri, who is a symbol of motivation and full support logistic and moral support all the time. I personally, I have interacted with him in his lab several times, and I am overwhelmed with his Beijing personality and his support and his motivation. Thank you all 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your kind words. Uh, may I request special guest, Dr. Sarah Minson, USGS VSA, to say a few words. Over to Sarah. Sarah, please unmute yourself. I just want to thank you all for having me and giving me this opportunity to join this amazing group. This has been a wonderful workshop that I contributed to in absolutely no way with an absolutely amazing lineup of speakers on really interesting topics. And um, I want to thank um, everyone for putting this together and really starting a wonderful uh, global collaboration. Thank you, Sarah, for your comments. Thank you very much. Now, may I request Dr. Saurabh Bora, Chief Scientist of CSN in Zurat, to say a few words. How about Dr. Saurabh Bora? Namaskar. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shantanu. It's a really a, uh, emotional moment for me that very religiously all of us were attending these two seminar daily on two sessions. And today we are ending with that particular scenario. This uh, global seismology and tectonics, this has become a dictionary for all of us to understand the seismotectonics of various parts of the world. And I must congratulate Dr. Santanu and his team to bring all the laureates whom you were observing in the in front of the screen, Professor Andrew Michael, Dapeng Zhao, and Professor Kayal, of course, Sarah Misen, and several others, they are all contributed very immensely in their field of domain. And under the guidance of our director, Honorable Director, Professor Sastri, we could bring all of you with the help of Ministry of External Affairs on this particular platform. With a single objective that we continuously improve our knowledge and understanding on seismology and seismotectonics of the terrain. So I think through this seminar, we have achieved to some extent this objective. And I'd like to inform you that this is the field season in northeastern region of India because there is a clear sunshine, no rainfall, temperature is a bit pleasant, and hundreds of national and international geologists, geomorphologists, tectonics, and seismologists, they are roaming around the nooks and corners of northeastern region of India to look to understand the geodynamics of northeastern India. So we look forward to, as I repeat, what our Honorable Director has said, it's a friendship, it's an international collaboration to the same objective. Once again, thank you all of you for your kind guidance. Namaskar. Thank you, sir, for your beautiful comments. Now, may I request our co-convener and group leader, Dr. Monuski Fukon, for his words. Over to Dr. Fukon. Good morning. A very good morning from India. Namaskar. Actually, we are uh, overwhelmed by the response from international community and all the stalwarts, uh, Professor Andrew Michael, the Peng Zhao, uh, Kyle Sar, uh, Sarah Minson, our uh, uh, other uh, the eminent personalities who have really contributed to this works, workshop and also the participants uh, those who have actively participated uh, from different countries of uh, the globe. So we extend our uh, heartfelt greetings to each and everyone and also express our deep sense of acknowledgement. So we hope that uh, uh, we will be able to continue this uh, my workshop and maybe one day as our honorable sister said, maybe we will be able to uh, conduct it in a physical mode and uh, We'll, uh, we'll be very happy to see you all 
here in our institute. So thank you very much. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fukun. Now, may I request our another co-container, Dr. Vijit K. Sodhuri, for his remarks. What to Dr. Sodhuri? Namaste from India and above. Good morning to all of you. First of all, it is a moment of great delight and a pleasure for all of us in the CSI News fraternity that we could successfully organize for the second time this global uh, uh, platform uh, for the amalgamation and the confluence of all earth scientists and young researchers all across the world to share their experiences in the various realms of earth science. I believe this has been a wonderful platform to uh, actually uh, brainstorm and bring forth the knowledge and expertise we all have gathered over the years. And I'm sure at least the young researchers and the aspiring young seismologists and geoscientists must have really, really uh, benefited from this program by broadening their horizon in various uh, realms of earth sciences. We have tried to cover the whole gamut of seismology and uh, I'm very much grateful and I'm highly obliged uh, by the act of grace of our honorable director, Dr. G. Narahari Shastri, for um, according his kind permission and giving us all the necessary facilities to conduct this program. Also, we are thankful to the resource persons, the speakers, the global participants who have made this show possible and we could uh, script another success story. And I do hope that in the future we'll be having your blessings, good wishes and cooperation to carry forward with civil action. Thank you and have a great day. Namaste. Thank you, Dr. Sadhuri. Thank you, Dr. Sadhuri. Now we have reached the end of the session. Thank you, Dr. Shantanu. The next item is vote of thanks by the convener. As we come to an end of this military function, may I take this opportunity to very briefly propose the vote of thanks. Honorable Chairman, Dr. G. Norris Sastri, Chief Guest, Dr. N. G. J. Michael, Guest of Honor, Professor Dateng Zhao, Official Guest, Professor Z. R. Kyle, Keynote Speaker of Finance Session, Dr. Sarah Minson, Dr. Saurabh Borwa, Dr. Monuske Fukon, Dr. Vijit Sadori, and my fellow colleagues and students. I do not have words to express my sense of gratitude and acknowledgement for gracing the valedictory function. First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Sekhar C. Mande, DG, CSIR, for his kind permission in organizing IBWGST 2021. I'm always thankful and forever remain thankful to Dr. G. Narahari Sastri, Director, CSIR Nate Zurhat, for his unconditional support and guidance in organizing this event. Working under his profound management is indeed a matter of great opportunity and privilege for me. He's a person of scientific rigor and always strives to upkeep scientific deliberations and therefore has been the powerhouse of this workshop. Dr. Andrew J. Michael from USGS probably has never uttered the word no. Every time, literally, every time I, as my days are nights for his time zone, I approach him for assistance, it's always a big yes. I am highly indebted to him for all his support and help. The assistance from Professor Dapengzo from Tohoku University and Professor J.R. Kyle have been phenomenal throughout the course of workshop. I extend my heartiest acknowledgement to both of them for being the session advisor and session chairman, respectively. Thanks to Dr. Saurabh Burwa and Dr. Monuske Fukon for their support and help in organizing the workshop. In a nutshell, I would like to particularly thank all the esteemed dignitaries for sparing precious time in spite of your overloaded schedule. I hope you'll continue to support the IPWGST brand in the near future and would appreciate your feedback on how to enhance it further. I thank all the organizing committee members for their collective efforts, which finally culminated with this highly rejoicing military function. I've always been in awe of the tremendous support bestowed by the participants. I honestly cannot thank you enough. Please bless and support us in the subsequent episodes of IPWGST. That concludes the military function. The last session of this day will start immediately after this session. Thank you. Thank you to all of, all of you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Gino Sastra, for being here. Thanks a lot, everyone. And Thank you. Thank you so much.
Ah, thank you. Now, before the last technical session start, let me introduce our speaker, Dr. Sarah Nelson, to our online attendees. Sarah is going to present a lecture on shaking is almost always a surprise. The earthquake that produced significant ground motion. She has a research geophysicist at the US Geological Survey since 2014. Before that, she has served as postdoctoral fellow at California Institute of Technology and Mendehal postdoctoral fellow at US Geological Survey. She completed her PhD in geophysics from California Institute of Technology in 2010, where she also pursued her MS degree. Dr. Minson's area of interest includes kinematics rupture models, earthquake early warning, Bayesian analysis, earthquake source mechanisms, crustal deformation, etc. She has received several prestigious awards and fellowships, such as US Geological Survey Star Award, which she owned several times, Iris Distinguished Lectureship, Kavli Fellowship, Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. Now, I'd like to request Dr. Minson to take about the digital space. About Dr. Minson. Good morning, everyone, or good evening if you're in the United States. Um, thank you so much for having me today. I'm just going to um, share my screen. And um, hopefully, you can now all um, see um, my slides. So um, this is work that I've done with um, a number of colleagues at the US Geological Survey, including Anne-Marie Borte, Elizabeth Cochran, and Sarah McBride, as well as Kevin Milner at the University of Southern California. The question I want to ask today is this. Earthquake shaking is variable. Sometimes earthquakes produce more shaking than you would expect. Sometimes they produce less shaking than you would expect. You expect large magnitude earthquakes to produce strong shaking, and they almost always do. But large magnitude earthquakes also occur very infrequently. Small magnitude earthquakes happen all the time, but it's only the very rare outlier small magnitude earthquake that produces strong shaking. So the question is, if you feel strong shaking, what is more likely to be the source of it? Is it the infrequent large magnitude earthquake doing what large magnitude earthquakes do? Or is it the unusual small earthquake that produces a lot of shaking despite being a small magnitude earthquake? This would be, as my grandmother would call it, a little earthquake with ambition. My colleague Ross Stein says that you should always start a talk with your conclusion. So I'm going to do that. And the answer is little earthquakes. Little earthquakes are responsible for almost all the cases of strong shaking that we feel. Why is this? Well, to illustrate that, let's do a back of the envelope calculation. And let's consider peak ground acceleration, PGA for short, at a distance of 60 kilometers from the earthquake rupture. Now, I picked that because if you look at the numbers from the um, ground motion prediction model, from Bohr et al. 2014, that just happens to work out nicely, that if you are 60 kilometers away from a magnitude 8 earthquake, the expected ground acceleration is about 10% g. This is about equivalent to modified Mercalli intensity 6, or what we call strong shaking. Now, when I say that it's the expected shaking, really that's just the mean of some bell curve dis distribution because shaking is variable and earthquakes can produce more or less shaking than average. Um, in fact, the rule of thumb is that the standard deviation on earthquake shaking amplitude is about a factor of two. So when I say that the expected shaking from a magnitude eight earthquake is 10% G, is strong shaking, what that really means is that there is a 50% probability that a magnitude eight earthquake will produce shaking exceeding 10% G, but there's also a 50% probability that a, that a magnitude 8 earthquake will produce shaking less than 10% G. So if I live a really, really, really long time, hundreds and hundreds of years, such that I live through not one, 
but two magnitude eight earthquakes, then on average, I expect that one of them will produce strong shaking. However, we're all familiar with the Gutenberg Richter distribution, which says that the frequency of earthquakes increases with decreasing magnitude, and this increases exponential. So for every magnitude eight earthquake, there are 10 magnitude seven earthquakes, 100 magnitude six earthquakes, 1,000 magnitude five earthquakes, and so on. So during this, during the many, many centuries that I'm pretending that I live, so that I live through not one, but two magnitude eight earthquakes, only one of which were actually produced strong shaking. During that same period, I'm going to live through six magnitude seven and a half earthquakes. Now a magnitude seven and a half earthquake is only expected to produce about 7% G shaking, about 7% of the force of gravity. And it, but, earth, but shaking is variable. And so there was still a, a one out of three chance that a magnitude seven and a half earthquake might be ambitious, might produce more shaking than you expect. And so it might end up producing shaking exceeding 10% G, but only a one out of three chance. However, I, while I'm waiting to live long enough to experience just one magnitude eight earthquake that ends up producing shaking exceeding 10% G, I'm going to live through six seven and a half earthquakes, magnitude seven and a half earthquakes. And those six earthquakes have a one out of three chance of producing strong shaking. So we expect on average that two magnitude seven and a half earthquakes will produce strong shaking for every one magnitude eight earthquake that does. So now if you will indulge me, I want to attempt to do some interaction with all of you. I want to get all of you to participate. So if you would please open up the Q&A window in your um, Microsoft Teams. I want you to, to tell me your best guess. For every one earthquake, for every one magnitude eight earthquake that produces strong shaking, two magnitude seven and a half, ma two magnitude seven and a half earthquakes produce strong shaking. How many magnitude seven earthquakes will produce strong shaking over the same time period? Please um, don't be shy, go into the Q&A and enter your best guess. And I'll uh, give you a little time if you want. Anyone want to try? Don't be shy. OK, well, the answer is that a magnitude seven earthquake has only a 19% chance of producing strong shaking. But there will be 20 magnitude seven earthquakes and 19% of 20 earthquakes means that we expect about four magnitude seven earthquakes to produce strong shaking for every one magnitude eight earthquake that does. And how many magnitude six and a half earthquakes will produce strong shaking? Well, any one magnitude six and a half earthquake has only a 9% chance of producing shaking exceeding 10% G. But there will be 63 magnitude six and a half earthquakes over the same time period. And 9% of 63 earthquakes means that six magnitude six and a half earthquakes will produce strong shaking. What about magnitude six earthquakes? Well, a magnitude six earthquake has only a 4% chance of producing strong shaking. But there will be 200 magnitude six earthquakes over the same time period. And 4% of 200 is seven. So we expect strong shaking from seven magnitude six earthquakes. How often will magnitude five and a half earthquakes produce strong shaking? Well, any given magnitude five and a half earthquake has just a 1% chance of producing strong shaking. But there will be 632 magnitude five and a half earthquakes over the same time period. And 1% of 632 is eight. So we expect about eight magnitude five and a half earthquakes to produce strong shaking. And finally, if we go down to magnitude five, the hazard curve turns over. 
And each magnitude 5 earthquake has just a 0.007% chance of producing strong shaking. And so e even though there are 2,000 magnitude 5 earthquakes, they don't contribute significantly to the seismic hazard at the level of 10% G and distance of 60 kilometers. Now, I should mention that this calculation was done using a particular ground motion model for it all 2014. Um, however, we have repeated this analysis with other ground motion models and have found the same results. In fact, um, the ball at all model shows the smallest contribution of strong shaking from small magnitude earthquakes. And so we'll present results from this model because it's the most conservative and it um, is the least likely to show a bias towards hazard from small magnitude earthquakes. Okay. So here are some statements that are simultaneously true. No earthquake smaller than magnitude 8 is expected to produce strong shaking. And yet, each magnitude 8 that causes strong shaking, you will feel strong shaking from 27 earthquakes of magnitude less than 8. And in fact, the magnitude most likely to produce strong shaking is a magnitude 5.5 earthquake. So, I, this is just a back of the envelope calculation. Do we actually see this in real life? When we look at records of earthquake shaking, do we see that most occurrences of hazardous shaking come from smaller magnitude earthquakes with anomalously large shaking? And I think the answer is yes. So we're going to look at three ground motion data sets. We're going to look at the at um, one year of recordings from the ANZA network in Southern California. This year of records recorded about 10,000 earthquakes, producing 120,000 records. And the earthquakes they observed ranged from magnitude 0 0.5 to magnitude 4.5. We're also going to look at the NGA REST2 dataset of global earthquake records. This is the preeminent global earthquake database. It's used as the basic as um, the data set that was used to build most of the ground motion models used around the world. The data set contains data from about 600 global earthquakes, um, about 21,000 records in total, and the earthquakes included in the data set range from magnitude 3 to magnitude 7.9. Um, finally, we are going to look at a seismic hazard model. We're going to look at the third California earthquake rupture forecast and then put that into the Bohr et al. ground motion model to develop a shaking hazard forecast for Los Angeles City Hall. And so when we put these three different databases together, we're going to end up looking at natural earthquakes ranging from magnitude 0 0.5 all the way up to magnitude 7.9. We will also end up looking at probabilistic seismic hazard analysis in the case of the use of three forecasts for Los Angeles City Hall. And we are going to have spatial coverage that is global in the case of NGA REST2, regional in the case of the ANZA network, and local in the case of the probabilistic seismic hazard analysis for Los Angeles City Hall. Okay, so let's disaggregate these three earthquake catalogs and see which magnitude earthquakes produce which levels of shaking. Now, you've probably seen ground motion disaggregations before. You take a, a collection of um, potential earthquake sources and you disaggregate them by magnitude and rupture. This is not what I'm going to do. Um, and I apologize in advance for the first of many times I'm going to mess with everybody's heads and plot in the weirdest way possible. Because at the end of the day, what we're interested in is how often, what is the frequency of currents or the probability of shaking as a function of uh, magnitude, distance, and the level of shaking that we care about. That's three different dimensions, and that's, that's really uh, one more dimension that can be plotted. So in typical hazard disaggregations, what you do is you pick a ground motion level that you say that you care about, and then you disaggregate the hazard into different magnitude and distance bins. But in this case, what we want to do is ask, how does shaking relate to earthquake magnitude? And which magnitudes produce which levels of shaking? So instead, what we're going to do is pick a particular distance bin and say for all the earthquakes at that distance, we will disaggregate the hazard by magnitude and shaking. And so that's going to look something like this. So this is a 3D histogram, and the height of each ball is how frequently um, shaking of this 
this amplitude from an earthquake of this magnitude of cause. And so we have magnitude on one axis and PGA on the other axis and height is given by, um, and frequency is given by height. Now I have colored each um, of the histogram bars by um, what kind of shaking this represents, right? Is this um, earthquakes producing the shaking that you would expect on average, which I have colored right? Is this um, a not energetic earthquake, a sad earthquake that produced less shaking than expected? Those are colored in shades of purple. Or is this, as my grandmother would call it, a little earthquake with ambition? Is this an earthquake that's producing more shaking than you would expect for its magnitude? And I've colored those uh, blue, green, yellow, red. And what you see is that almost all of the hazard, almost all of the height is coming from um, histograms that are colored in the blue, green, yellow, red family. They are coming from the earthquakes that are producing more shaking than you would expect from their magnitude. They are coming from the little earthquakes with ambition. This was um, looking at the ANZA catalog of Southern California earthquakes. If we look at the NGA West 2 database of global earthquakes, or if we look at the probabilistic seismic hazard analysis for Los Angeles City Hall, you see exactly the same behavior. Almost all the hazard is coming from the brightly colored balls, from the little earthquakes with ambition. Um, these analysis are done for uh, the hazard for peak ground acceleration. We can repeat this, an this analysis of the observed data for peak ground velocity or PGV. And again, you see the same behavior. Almost all of the hazard is coming from smaller magnitude earthquakes radiating one, two, or three sigma sh stronger shaking than you would expect for their magnitude. And very little of the shaking is coming from the very largest magnitude earthquakes, the magnitude se seven and a half and eight. So why is this happening? Um, again, you've probably seen lots of plots of ground motion models, right? The way they build those models is they take um, records of shaking amplitude as a function of magnitude and distance, and then they build empirical relationships that give you the best possible prediction of the expected shaking amplitude as a function of, ma of earthquake magnitude and the distance between you and the earthquake rupture. Um, again, I'm going to make things very confusing by not showing you those plots in the way that they're usually shown, um, but instead flipping those plots on their side and showing you um, earthquake magnitude as a function of shaking amplitude. Um, and the black lines in these plots, the well, let me start with the blue dots. The blue dots are the observed shaking amplitudes um, for all earthquakes within a 10 to 30 kilometer distance. The black lines represent ground motion models that were developed for that data set. So the black line on the left is the ground motion model that uh, Bohr et al. 2014 built by fitting the data in the NGA West 2 database, the blue dots in that panel. And on the right, the black line is a model developed by Sahakian et al. that again was fit directly to those data. So this is a completely self-consistent analysis. Um, however, what you see is that there was a good deal of scatter. And it's possible for many different magnitude earthquakes to produce the same level of shaking, or for the same level of shaking to be found for the same magnitude of earthquake. But Different magnitudes of earthquake do not happen at the same frequency. Small magnitude earthquakes happen exponentially more often than large magnitude earthquakes do. And so the most common source of strong shaking is actually a small magnitude earthquake producing greater than expected shaking. The, the ground motion prediction equation, the ground motion model as shown in the black lines, is the median shaking as a function of magnitude and distance. But since smaller magnitudes happen more often, the most common source of shaking is a small magnitude earthquake that's producing anomalously large shaking. Also note that shaking saturates. Um, there's simply no magnitude earthquake that is expected to produce shaking exceeding about half a G. And so in a sense, any time that you absorb strong shaking, 
it's an outlier. It's an earthquake doing something strange. It just happens that it's more often a small magnitude earthquake doing something extra strange than a large magnitude earthquake doing something a little strange. Now, I want to point out that this is not a problem with our ground motion models, right? The, the plot I was just showing you, the ground motion models were perfect. They were regressions fit directly to those data sets. But again, the ground motion models are showing you what the most likely shaking is for an earthquake of a given magnitude. We are asking the reverse question. We are saying if you experience shaking of a certain amplitude, what is the most likely magnitude of the earthquake that produced that shaking? And because small earthquakes happen more often, it's usually a smaller magnitude earthquake than you would expect. So here is a plot where the black line shows the mean magnitude of all the earthquakes shown to observe, all the earthquakes observed to produce shaking exceeding one, two, three, four, or five percent G in the ANZA catalog. And the green line is the um, predicted, is the, is the mean of all the earthquakes that were predicted to produce shaking exceeding one, two, three, four, and five percent G. And you'll notice that that is consistently larger, right? There was a consistent bias in the actual observations in the black line for the source of earthquake shaking to be coming from smaller magnitude earthquakes than you expect. Again, this is nothing wrong with the model. The model is fit to the data. The point is just that we are asking the question that's the opposite of a traditional ground motion model. We are asking which magnitude earthquakes are the source of seismic hazard. Um, the same is true if we look at the NGA REST2 database. The black line is the mean magnitude of all the earthquakes in the catalog that were observed to produce shaking exceeding 10, 20, 30, 40, or 50 percent G. And the colored lines are the mean magnitudes that would, of the earthquakes that were predicted to have produced shaking exceeding 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50 percent G um, from three different ground motion models that were built from the NGA REST2 database, the um, ASK14 model, the BSSA14 model, and the CY14 model. And again, the actual source of shaking, the, thing, the black line, is consistently smaller magnitude than the predictions from the ground motion model. And you'll notice that the bias is smallest for the red between the red and the black line, between BSSA 14 and the black line. And that's why we only show results for BSSA 14. So all the results I'm showing are at most an underestimate of how much hazard is really coming from small magnitude earthquakes. So can we model this behavior? Can we produce a theoretical model to tell us which magnitude earthquakes are the source of hazard? And the answer is yes. Um, because all we need to know is a few simple things. You need to know how often earthquakes of different magnitudes happen. And that's simply the Gutenberg-Richter relationship, right? That for every magnitude eight earthquake, there are 10 magnitude sevens and 100 magnitude sixes and 1,000 magnitude fives. You need to know the distribution of shaking that any particular earthquake might expect. And that's what the ground motion models tell us. They say that for any earthquake of a particular magnitude and distance, the expected shaking is log normally distributed with a known mean and a known standard deviation. That is typically about a factor of two. And then the posterior probability of magnitudes that cause shaking exceeding whatever level of shaking you care about I've notated it by zero here, is simply given by Bayes' theorem. And it's simply the product of um, the log normal distribution, or the really actually the integral of that, times the Gutenberg Richter distribution. And the answer is something like this. It's very, very ugly. You do not need to memorize it, but it is something that we can write down analytically. So now let's ask if we can quantify, if we have an analytical model, can we quantify how much shaking has, is biased towards little earthquakes producing anomalously strong shaking compared to larger magnitude earthquakes producing expected levels of shaking? And so what we're going to do to quantify this bias towards small magnitude earthquakes is to first consider as a reference what would happen if ground motion was not variable? 
And if every earthquake simply put out the amount of shaking you would expect it to for its magnitude and its distance. And that would simply be the Gutenberg Richter distribution um, with a lower limit at whatever the smallest magnitude is that you would expect to produce shaking at that at the level you care about at the a natural distance. Um, we can then in turn derive uh, the mean of that distribution, which looks something like the equations above. And then we can in turn compare that to the mean of the distribution of earthquakes that actually do produce shaking exceeding some level that you care about, which we denote y0. Um, that turns out to be very, very complicated, but it's absolutely something that you can derive analytically. And then we can look at the change in mean and use that as a metric of how much the source of earthquake hazard is biased towards small earthquakes, small magnitude earthquakes with anonymously large shaking. So again, the distribution of earthquakes that you would expect to produce strong shaking is simply going to be a truncated exponential. It's the Gutenberg Richter distribution truncated at whatever magnitude you think is going to produce strong shaking. So for example, of 60 kilometers distance, no earthquake smaller than magnitude eight is expected to produce strong shaking at 60 kilometers distance. So it's simply an exponential distribution truncated at magnitude eight. Um, meanwhile, the PDF of the earthquakes that are expected, uh, sorry, of the earthquakes that actually do produce strong shaking has um, a more of a bell curve shape, or rather I think of it as being a dorsal fin shape because it kind of reminds me of the fin on the back of a dolphin or a whale. And so the mean of the distribution of earthquakes that should produce shaking because it's an exponential, it's almost the smallest magnitude that might. Whereas the mean of the earthquakes that actually do produce strong shaking, it's much closer to the median of the distribution. It's right in the middle. And so this metric that we're using is actually a very conservative metric because it's not measuring the change in distance from the middle of the two distributions, but rather from the bottom of one distribution to the middle of the other. So is this model correct? I just wrote down a bunch of equations, so let's take a moment to validate it. So let us look at the ANSA data set at a distance of 12 kilometers plus or minus one and a half kilometers and look at all the records um, for shaking exceeding 0.01% G. And according to our analytical model, the blue line is the distribution of the magnitudes of all the earthquakes that should produce shaking exceeding 0.01% G, while the purple curve is the distribution of the magnitudes of all the earthquakes that actually will exceed 0.01% G. And if we look at the records in the ANSA database, well, they look pretty much like the two PDFs that we de derived analytically. So I would say this theoretical model validates. And if you want to know what the difference is between these two distributions, what the difference in the mean is of these two distributions, um, it says that the difference is 0.2 magnitude units. The average magnitude of earthquakes that actually produce shaking exceeding 0.01% G is 0.2 magnitude units smaller than you would expect. And I would say if you look at earthquake hazard as a function of magnitude, there are essentially three domains. Domain one are, magnitude, are earthquakes of such small magnitude that you would not expect them to produce shaking exceeding your threshold, but in reality they do. Um, domain two um, in the middle is the earthquakes that you would expect to be the most common source of shaking exceeding your threshold. But in fact, because ground motion is variable, many of these earthquakes end up producing less shaking than expected, and so they contribute much less to the shaking hazard than you would expect. And domain three are earthquakes of such large magnitude that they always produce shaking exceeding your threshold. However, they are also earthquakes of such large magnitude that they simply occur so infrequently that they do not contribute to the seismic hazard much at all. Now, this was kind of a silly analysis. We were looking at a catalog of tiny earthquakes and shaking exceeding 0.01% G. So let's do this analysis again for some numbers we care about. For example, how about shaking exceeding 5% G or 10% G? 
Um, and again, um, we see that the analytical model shown by the solid lines uh, fit the observation shown by the dash line, the dash, sorry, shown by the histograms very well. So the theoretical model is valid. And you see that there was a change in mean that the source of the, that the distribution of earthquake magnitudes that actually produce shaking exceeding 5 and 10% G in purple is significantly smaller than the magnitudes of the earthquakes that you would have expected to produce shaking exceeding 5 and 10% G. Um, at 5% G, the bias is uh, 0 0.4 magnitudes units, and for 10% G, it gets even larger. The earthquakes that actually produce shaking exceeding 10% G are 1.4 magnitude units smaller than you would expect. And so armed with a theoretical model that we feel is valid, we can evaluate this anywhere for any um, level of shaking and ask how much is shaking biased to small earthquakes? And we measure that using delta mean. Um, so in this plot, the solid lines are the earthquakes that actually exceed 20, 40, 60, 80, or 100% G shaking, whereas the dashed lines are the magnitudes of the earthquakes that should have exceeded that threshold. And if you take the difference between the two, you get a how much is shaking hazard biased towards smaller magnitude earthquakes. And the answer is that it's consistently biased towards smaller magnitude earthquakes. That bias increases for higher and higher levels of shaking until when you get up to shaking exceeding 35% G, the the magnitudes of the earthquakes that actually produce shaking exceeding 35% G is almost two and a half magnitude units smaller than you would expect. And for complete this, we have redone this analysis at uh, using different uncertainty models to make sure it's robust to the choice of uncertainty model. And in fact, it is. We um, see a consistent behavior with a consistent bias towards hazard coming from smaller magnitude earthquakes than you expect, the little earthquakes with ambition, and that that uh, bias gets larger, the stronger the shaking that you care about. So the conclusion from all of this is that most occurrences of any level of shaking, including strong and potentially damaging levels of shaking, comes most often from smaller magnitude earthquakes with stronger than expected shaking. Right, these are the little earthquakes with ambition, as my grandmother would say. So one way to think about this is that large magnitude earthquakes will produce strong shaking and they will impact a large region. So in California, we often talk about the big one, the potential of having a magnitude eight rupture on the San Andreas fault. And someday that will happen. And someday there will be a magnitude eight on the Southern San Andreas fault. And someday it will bring strong and potentially damaging shaking to all parts of the greater Los Angeles region. However, while we are waiting for that earthquake to happen, we have already experienced the 1971 San Fernando earthquake of magnitude 6.7, the 1994 Northridge earthquake of magnitude 6.6, the 1987 Whittier Narrows earthquake of magnitude 5.9, and the 1933 Long Beach earthquake of magnitude 6.4. And we will experience, experience many, many more earthquakes like this. Each one of these earthquakes are smaller magnitude, so they impacted a smaller area, but each of them locally produced shaking just as strong and potentially just as damaging over a localized area near the earthquake rupture. And these earthquakes keep happening. They keep happening everywhere. And so while we are waiting for the big one to eventually happen, we expect every place to experience very strong shaking from earthquakes of this type more than once, and they will tile up the entire Los Angeles region. So one way to think about this, we really should be talking more about the medium one size earthquakes than the earthquakes we like to call the big one. But in all fairness, all I have done so far is show that shaking comes most often from small magnitude earthquakes than from big magnitude earthquakes. But are they as damaging over the affected area? Because again, each smaller magnitude earthquake 
impacts a more localized region. It's just that there are more of them and they happen everywhere so that in total they produce more shaking than the big magnitude earthquakes. But is the shaking as damaging? Do you expect the same impacts if you feel, for example, modified Mercalli 7 intensity from a magnitude 6 earthquake as from a magnitude 8 earthquake? And this is really a fascinating question. And the answer is fascinating whichever way it is. I mean, if the answer is yes, then since most of the shaking comes from little earthquakes, that suggests that most of the danger comes from little earthquakes. If the answer is no, then that suggests that damage is strongly call controlled by factors other than shaking amplitude, such as shaking duration or the frequency content of shaking. And to be clear, I am not an engineer and I am not qualified to answer this question. But I want to tell you a few things that I think suggest that the answer is yes. The little earthquakes are as damaging as big earthquakes over the area they affect. So one reason I think this might be true is if you look at the modified Mercalli intensity scale. So modified Mercalli intensity is supposed to measure the impact of shaking. Is it, does it feel light or does it feel strong? Is it damaging and how severe is the damage? Now, there are these things called ground motion intensity conversion equations, such as this one derived by Warden et al. 2012. And what these equations do is, again, these are empirical relationships and they relate um, all the source information you could have about earthquake, the shaking amplitude, the magnitude, the distance to the earthquake um, to the impact it had to its modified Mercalli intensity at a location. And they do this regression against distance and magnitude and peak ground acceleration and peak ground velocity and other estimates of shaking amplitude. And they tell you how MMI scales with all of these factors. And if you look at the value of these coefficients, if you look at how modified Mercalli intensity scales with shaking amplitude and magnitude, in other words, how the impact of shaking scales with shaking amplitude, such as PGA and PGB, and magnitude, the answer is that the coefficients are orders of magnitude larger on PGA and PGB than they are on magnitude. They scale strongly with ground motion intensity. They scale weakly with magnitude. In fact, even weirder, the coefficients on magnitude are negative. I'm not arguing that that's something that we should necessarily believe, but it says that, at least in this relationship, to whatever extent, shaking of the same amplitude has different intensity for different magnitudes, it goes the wrong way. And that for some reason, the same level of shaking from a smaller magnitude earthquake is slightly more impactful than the same amplitude of shaking from a larger magnitude earthquake. But again, that isn't what I take away from this. I would just take away from this that modified Mercalli intensity, the impact of shaking, is really controlled by the amplitude of shaking, peak ground acceleration and peak ground velocity. Another argument that suggests that um, it's really just shaking amplitude that matters and not magnitude um, is if we look at um, what's inside a uh, PAGER, which is the Prompt Assessment of Global Earthquakes for Response. This is the US Geological Survey's leading product for assessing earthquake impact, um, which was built out of a global population exposure atlas. Um, and in this analysis, when they are trying to determine how many fatalities they think there will be, um, when an earthquake happens, the relationship that they built to do that forecast shaking fatality purely as a function of shaking intensity, MMI alone. And as we just saw, MMI is determined by PGA and PGB. Right. The earthquake magnitude does not go into the um, expected fatality rate for an earthquake. In fact, if we dig deeper, and look at the fatality data that was used to build the page all um, for uh, fatality forecast. The data look like these. So the blue dots are the number of shaking fatality um, in, a, in an earthquake normalized by the population that was exposed to MMI7 shaking. So on the previous slide, MMI7 is really the level of shaking um, at which fatalities start to occur. So the blue dots are the fatality rate um, in terms uh, for um, every single earthquake shown um, uh, by the blue dots. And so while a large magnitude earthquake 
um, may have may impact a larger area and have a larger total number of fatalities. We have normalized that effect by dividing by the population exposed. So the question is pound for pound for the number of people exposed to MMI7 shaking. What are your chances of being killed by MMI7 shaking if it comes from a magnitude 8 earthquake versus a 7 or a 6? Um, and the black dots show the median fatality rate um, in each magnitude bin with size proportional to the number of earthquakes in that bin. And what you see is that the fatality rate is absolutely flat as a function of magnitude. MMI 7 from a magnitude 6 earthquake is just as likely to kill you as MMI 7 from a magnitude 8 earthquake. Or, oh, good news, honestly, it's just as unlikely to kill you um, as shaking from a large magnitude earthquake because the fatality rate is on average uh, 1 in 10,000. So what does this all mean? What does this mean for seismic hazards, for how often we think shaking happens, and for all the things that rely on our estimates of seismic hazards, such as determining local building codes? And the answer is, this means absolutely nothing. It has zero impact. This information is already in the hazard maps. When you're doing a hazard analysis, you look at the distribution of all potential earthquake sources, and then you look at the distribution of all potential earthquake shaking from each of those earthquake sources. And so all of the uncertainty, all of the variability, and all of the Gutenberg Richter information is already in the hazard map. All we have done here is disaggregate the hazard. And in the case of the use of three analysis for Los Angeles, we were literally disaggregating an existing hazard analysis and asking in the existing hazard analysis, where, which earthquakes are the source of the hazard? And the answer is it's the little earthquakes producing more shaking than you would expect. But the total hazard is the same. The complete hazard analysis is the same. This has zero impact on our understanding of total seismic hazard or what our building code should be. What are the implications of this work for earthquake early warning? Well, there I'm afraid that the answer is not as Nice. Um, so the idea with earthquake early warning is that um, an earthquake begins and you track the rupture as it evolves and you alert people um, that they may experience shaking. And if it turns out that the rupture is turns out to be a large magnitude earthquake, if it continues to grow in size and gets closer to your location and grows in magnitude, then it will produce strong shaking near you and you will have um, received um, significant warning to take action before the strong shaking arrives at your location. So really the scenario in which earthquake early warning can be the most beneficial, in which you can get significant warning time and potentially take protective action, is in the case of a large magnitude earthquake that starts far away from you and takes a long time to get close to you. However, this is not where the seismic hazard is. In fact, almost all the seismic hazard is coming from little earthquakes right under your feet. Um, for example, this um, map on the right, which comes from a study that David Ward recently published, and it shows how much warning you would have for an earthquake like the 1994 Northridge, California earthquake. Um, and what he's showing here is the circles are um, how far the sh is how long it how far the shaking will have extended by the time you could conceivably get an alert out. And the answer is that by the time you could conceivably have gotten a lot out, um, the shaking would have already happened in all the areas that are colored bright red, all the places that experience significant impacts. There simply isn't enough warning to be had for these smaller magnitude earthquakes because their impacts are so spatially lo localized. They affect such a compact spatial region. Um, and unfortunately, these are the earthquakes that are your main source of hazard. It's not the real large magnitude earthquake. So what are the implications of this work for emergency management? I really have no idea. 
I'm not an emergency manager. I cannot have an opinion on emergency management, but I can imagine that there are reasons why emergency managers might still want to focus on what we like to call the big one, right? The magnitude eight earthquake, the worst case scenario, because right, a really big regional scale disaster is different. And there are other issues you have to deal with, like not being able to rely on neighboring um, localities to provide mutual aid because they are having the same disaster that you are. But it's important to know that this is not a likely scenario, and it's probably not the scenario we want to communicate to the public. What do we want to say to the public? Well, I would suggest that we want to stop talking about the big one, about the rare magnitude eight calamity. Right? This is not where the seismic hazard is coming from. And worse, it scares people away from preparing. Um, one of the biggest preparation success stories we've had in the United States was in the San Francisco Bay Area after the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. And the people who lived through that earthquake um, really created a cultural preparedness of preparing for another earthquake like that. But they were motivated by their experiences of that more moderate sized earthquake. They were not taking preparedness action out of fear of some future bigger earthquake. And so the questions I have are, do we spend enough time talking about earthquakes like Loma Prieta, these uh, more moderate, more regional earthquakes, than the really big earthquakes like the famous 1906 San Francisco earthquake, right? Do we spend enough time talking about a magnitude six earthquake under one of our liquefiable cities compared to a mega quake? And if we talked more about the little earthquakes, would people prioritize preparedness differently? So this is um, an idea that comes from my uh, co-author, Dr. Sarah McBride. She suggests that we think of big earthquakes, big magnitude earthquakes as sharks and medium magnitude earthquakes as horses. Um, sharks are scary but you almost never come nose to snout with a shark. They're just very real. Horses aren't scary, but they're really common. And so if you actually look at the statistics, every year, horses kill about four times as many people as sharks kill. Um, and yet, people don't, aren't afraid of horses. People love horses. So what Dr. McBride says is, it's time to talk about the medium earthquakes. If we centered people's lived experience with little earthquakes, you would have an opportunity to develop a preparedness culture that's free of fear, that's based on people's lived experiences and things that they feel capable of preparing for. So I'm coming to an end. I just have one final thought I want to share. So the title of this talk is a little strange. I called this talk, Shaking is Almost Always a Surprise. And I, I picked the word surprise because I found it in an old damage survey report for an earthquake. And what this old um, report said um, was, quote, the amount of damage to publicly owned newer earthquake resistive structures was a surprise and dismay to large elements of the public. In these rapidly changing times, it seems that the public is beginning to expect a greater degree of damage control than that demanded by code. And the earthquake they were talking about and the rapidly changing times they were talking about was not any of the earthquakes you're probably thinking of. It was in fact the 1969 Santa Rosa, California earthquakes when a pair of magnitude five and a fraction earthquakes caused the equivalent of about $50 million in damage in today's dollars. And you're probably sitting there going, I've never heard of these earthquakes. And that is exactly the right reaction. These are a pair of tiny earthquakes that have been almost completely forgotten. I am um, until recently, there weren't even any publications um, about these earthquakes. They were just a pair of little baby earthquakes in a little tiny town a couple of hours north of San Francisco, California. But they were also the most 
damaging earthquakes in California since the 1906 San Francisco earthquake until the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. And these sorts of little earthquakes producing significant damage in the area impacted locally by these little earthquakes is exactly the most common source of damage. So if the amount of damage and the amount of shaking from these earthquakes was a surprise, well then, shaking is almost always a surprise. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. It was wonderful. Thank you, Sarah, for your beautiful presentation. Now may I request our session, uh, our international advisor, Dr. NDC Michael, for his comments. Over to Dr. NDC Michael. Thank you, Sarah. That, that was wonderful. And I feel like every time I hear you talk about this topic, that the talk just gets better and better. And today I, I came in thinking, well, in his Joyner lecture this year, Julian Bomber has been talking about, well, no, really, it's the big earthquakes, it's duration. And I was planning to get your response to that. But I feel like you've already given your response, which is that actually, if you look at earthquake records, you know, these medium earthquakes, I think that's the key maybe, is it's the medium earthquakes, um, you know, some of the really small earthquakes that don't have much duration at all, maybe not as much damage, but these five and a halfs are, and that's very important for my work thinking about how we want to communicate our aftershock forecast. We were actually literally just discussing this today. What is the magnitude aftershock we most want to focus on? If we give someone one number, one bullet point, is it a six, is it a five? Maybe it's a 5.5. Um, and so I think this work informs so much. I, I, but you always bring up so many things. Um, by the way, moose kill more people in Alaska than bears. Big, heavy animals that run fast are very dangerous, and also moose are very <laughs> aggressive in, in, in mating season. Um, but and I, appropriately, I the symbol of our government department, the Department of Interior, is the bison, a large, right. heavy animal that is very dangerous if you get too close to it. Yes, good point, good point. And um, I think there's some other lessons. I just, I'm just going to make some comments. I don't really have a... You, the talk was too complete for a question. Um, one is, I think this work also points out to those of us who run seismic networks, that the people who call us up and go, I felt an earthquake, and we're like, I don't think there was an earthquake. They might have been at the location where the earthquake was the little earthquake with ambition. And we maybe um, were underestimating what they were feeling. There's a really good question in the in the chat that I think I'll let you talk about. Um, how to select the minimum cutoff magnitude limit in PSHA. Um, but I want to point out that there's, this has been a real problem in some of the more advanced models like USERV 3 or some of the other earlier California models. And some of those models have actually been criticized for giving too much probability to large earthquakes. And the reason is that because those, earth, those models are, are include plate tectonics so that the amount of moment that can come out in a 50-year period is related to the plate rate in the 50-year period that when we give too much probability to a very big earthquake we're taking it away from smaller earthquakes now whether or not we've actually gotten that wrong i don't know but this balance is becomes more and more important as we get to these sophisticated PSHA models that include plate tectonics. And so I, I think your work puts some extra emphasis on that. But I'm going to let you see if you want to answer the, the minimum cutoff magnitude uh, question in the chat. So, but anyway, thank you so much. I I am so glad that, um, that you wound up um, at a talk that I was able to come to because I, I learn something every time. Yeah. Thank you so much, Andy. You are so nice. Um, I think the cutoff magnitude is a really good question. And I think the answer is, isn't really clear for a couple of which, because we have up until now sort of assumed that we only care about large magnitude earthquakes. 
And so if all you know hazard goes down to magnitude five or whatever, that's plenty of buffer that that covers everything. And so I've been recently playing around with this a little bit. Albeit at, at very low levels because I was doing this for earthquake early warning where they're trying to alert for felt levels of shaking, which is really low. And so if you have to then consider earthquakes that would you would normally not feel but might be producing stronger than expected shaking and might include felt shaking, then your cutoff magnitude is ridiculously low. Um, but the circle I got myself into, which makes things a bit complex, is that the ground motion models themselves have only been built on earthquakes of a certain size. So, you know, I could take the use of model and I can go crazy and I can turn the minimum magnitude down as small as I want. But then if I put that into a ground motion model, I'm rapidly running into the unconstrained bottom of the ground motion model. So I think in order to answer this really interesting question about what the cutoff magnitude would have to be, you'd have to you'd have to reevaluate all the aspects of it, right? You'd have to ask what is going into something like USOF to give you the earthquakes and what is going into your ground motion model and can you actually, and do you actually know what the ground motions you expect from these smaller magnitude earthquakes are and walk your way down until you feel safe that you have actually collected all the magnitudes that you need to to contribute to the hazard. But I, I'm not sure that, that Either of our earthquake models and our ground motion models are, are robust at the levels of at the small magnitudes that you'd have to go to to feel safe that you have gone below the minimum magnitude you need to get to. Yeah, let me, let me just comment because I think that's a, a a very perceptive answer, and I think it came up a little bit in your um, discussion of the MMI relationships, where you pointed out that in some of the cases, the the, the prediction was that smaller earthquakes produced higher MMIs, and that was maybe a little suspect. And, and this happens in some of the ground motion models, which have higher order terms, where actually as you get to smaller and smaller earthquakes, all of a sudden the ground motions start going back up. The median ground motion starts mm -hmm. going back up mm -hmm. because they're essentially unconstrained over that range. And actually, I, I think at, in the first talk of this session, I actually showed I some, some plots of ground motions expected from earthquakes and uh, from aftershocks combined with the main shock. And I went down as far as magnitude three. Um, but I used actually a very old, very simple um, ground motion prediction equation or ground motion model from Alan Cornell in 1979, which does not have that complexity. It had, it, it, you, it, it works for any magnitude. I don't think it was constrained for any magnitude, but at least as you get to smaller earthquakes, the mean ground motion keeps going down. And so I was willing to use it for that case. And I think you're right that that we that we this is a very important question that that uh, CK Keshri has brought up. And but the the difficulty of answering it is something that we really need to address by trying to control the behavior of these ground motion models. Obviously, we don't want to use a ground motion model from 1979. We've learned a lot about ground motion since then. Um, but we need to constrain them at lower magnitudes. That's that's a wonderful insight. Agreed, a thousand percent. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, uh, Minson. Uh, now may I request Professor Zerkail, the session chairman, for his comments. How about Professor Zerkail? Oh well, uh, Sarah, we really enjoyed your your talk. Excellent talk and insight. Uh, into the ground shaking by small earthquakes. Everything is fine with your you know, uh, so far. The I think in last slide. Uh, you have explained uh, why it is necessary. Uh, you have explained that insurance uh, maybe may demand, you know, building good modifications. So you have explained everything, but I have a, you know, as a ground seismologist, I have a little query. You have it. You have talked about uh, frequency and distance of the earthquake, a dependence for the shaking. But I would also, uh, I'm wondering whether the depth and height response is also equally responsible. For example, in Jabalpur earthquake, within this intensity MMI 8, one building, very oil building, I mean oil build building, 
engineering building collapsed and a weak building survives just 200 meter away. So ground shaking is not only dependent, I suppose, on, on frequency and distance, but also on depth and side response. Your comments on this, please. Absolutely, and I was a little free with my terminology. I talked about big earthquakes versus little earthquakes, but really I'm talking about shaking and the and the how the variability of shaking combined with Gutenberg Richter means that most occurrences at any site in the catalog, like overall everything, is due to to smaller magnitude earthquakes than you think because of Gutenberg Richter and the variability. But as you said, the source of the variability isn't just the earthquake, it is the site, the path, um, and all those other things. Um, and clearly, right, in a perfect world, we would have, you know, perfect, uh, perfect um, models to forecast the shaking at any site from any earthquake. Um, but still, if you define some reference for what magnitude earthquake you think should should correspond to an earthquake at that size, you would find that on average, globally, the 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 source is a smaller magnitude than than you would otherwise think. Um, and when I did the ground motion models, I um, for example, the, the ball at all ground motion model has, you know, extensive is a regression with many, many the NGA REST2 um, GMPs, ground motion prediction equations, those ground motion models have many, many terms, right? They have, you know, what style of faulting is it and how deep is it and you know what's the VS30 value and and I and I ran all of those terms when I did the analysis. Um it's and it's and it's they're all closed loops, right? I I use the NGA REST2 database versus the predictions from the ground motion model that have been fit to the NGA REST2 database in all of its glory with all of its site terms and source uh, terms and all those other things. So, um, so it's not it's, it's again it's not the ground motion model, right? That is a that is a complete closed system. It is self consistent. And it is, and as you say, it's all these other things that are making this variability, which then when you combine that variability with the fact that small magnitude earthquakes are happening more often, means that those smaller magnitude earthquakes with their particular sources and their particular paths and their particular and the, the particular site that your building happens to be on has more chance to line up just right or just wrong, depending on your uh, point of view. With a smaller magnitude earthquake than a larger magnitude earthquake, simply because larger magnitude earthquakes are so infrequent. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you, over sir. To Santanu, over to Santanu, please. Thank you, sir. Now, may I request our session co chairman, Professor Surabulwa, for his uh, comments. Over to Dr. Surabulwa. Uh, thank you, Professor Sara for your wonderful lecture. It's a really a great insight for me. Uh, so far, PG estimation is concerned and how it uh, reduces with the distance. And uh, very importantly, you have mentioned about the um, horses, which is more devastating than earthquake. That was, uh, that really I liked it. And, but I have a query uh, aligned to the um, maximum credible earthquake for hazard estimation of California city. What is the MC you prefer basically for hazard estimation of California city or related to San Andreas fault? That is a great question. It's actually a question that I think Andy Michael could answer better than me because he is part of the group that has developed the um, formal community model for earthquake ruptures in California, the Uniform California Earthquake Rupture Forecast, um, USOF. Um, I, can, I can share the joke that our colleague Tom Hanks loves to make that the um, maximum credible earthquake is epsilon smaller than the minimum incredible earthquake. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, I think I want to pass that back to Andy, if you don't mind, for your opinion on the um, maximum credible earthquake in California. So it's a really interesting question. 
Um, I, I think we are somewhat biased that we, that, you know, we, we tend to think it's about what we've seen. And the, the interesting thing in California is that we have actually seen two large earthquakes that take up a large amount of the San Andreas Fault, our largest continuous fault. And they would be 1906, which goes from essentially the creeping zone near where the Loma Prieta earthquake was, somewhat south of San Francisco and where Sarah and I are located, all the way to the Mendocino Triple Junction, where it has the fault terminates because it, it runs into a triple junction. And then starting south of um, Parkfield, California, where we know we have repeating magnitude sixes, which is the southern end of the creeping section, you know, we feel that the 1857 earthquake probably ran all the way down. And again, both of these earthquakes are around 7.8 or 7.9. We know their fault lengths. We think we have some understanding of the depth of the possible faulting, and we can make that all make a fair bit of sense. Um, and then you have to say, well, what about ruptures? Like people have now modeled ruptures that very large earthquakes may rupture deeper than the brittle ductile transition, just providing you with more fault area and a larger magnitude. Um, we now, you know, have to consider what about very high speed dynamic rupture hitting the creeping section and going into it. And actually, the USERF model actually does do that. We do actually have ruptures in the USERF model that go through the creeping section. And um, those are very unlikely ruptures in the model. Are they credible? Um, yeah, Dave Schwartz, who's a paleoseismologist, and I think tends to believe that we've seen the behavior, you know, belittles those. And we always have to point out, well, they don't really take a very much moment in the model. We're not stealing a lot from the medium earthquakes with those ruptures. Um, so I think that model actually gives a very wide range. Um, Norm Sleep at Stanford University keeps reminding us that he thinks we're underestimating the possibility of a really long thrust earthquake at the at the edge of the Central Valley. The incredibly rare, very slow vertical deformation, but once in a while that could maybe be even bigger than the San Andreas Fault. Um, again, with a dipping fault, you would have more surface area before you got to the brittle ductile transition. That we don't have in the model. I think we have a lot in the model, but I, I really dislike it. it I, I feel we have to try to explain probabilistics to people who want determinism. So like emergency managers, sometimes they're like, well, what's really the maximum? What's the worst case scenario? And then we say, well, maximum credible. How do we define that? And I think I think we really have to get better at explaining probabilistic seismic hazard analysis. And I think the problem is that we keep talking about the recurrence of large earthquakes. And this is because we think about Poisson models. I'm, a, I'm on my favorite, like you, by, by two years of this, you've gotten my point that I don't like Poisson models for a lot of, I think they're useful, but they have limitations. And we talk about 10% in 50 years as being a 500 year recurrence, or 2% in 50 years as being a 2,500 year recurrence. And people are like, well, 500 years? I mean, I mean you know, that's too yeah. long to think about. But if you tell someone, okay, in the next 50 years, are you willing to take a 10% chance of your system failing? Um, are you willing to take a 2% chance of your hospital failing? I think we can, if we word it as risk, what risk are you willing to be able to take of not carrying out your functions? Um, and then I think that's the way we focus on it and just try to get away from this concept because, oh boy, is it a tough one to deal with. And I, but I think we can do better at explaining these things. And it's interesting with, with tall buildings in Los Angeles, some of the owners of those buildings have said, well, actually, we really only want to take like a 50% chance in 50 years of the building not being functional. And um, so it drives the seismic hazard to a different level when we really talk to the users in terms that they can actually relate to on a human scale. So I Thank just sidestepped that question completely, didn't I? I hope to. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It, it's true that there is no clear cut recipe for this. Exactly. We have to have a lot of permutation and combination. Thank you once again uh, I, for this. I, I will say, by the way, that when the movie San Andreas was made, if it has made it around the world, we did belittle the earthquake in that movie as being too large. <laughs> so <laughs> they went, whatever the credible earthquake is, they went too far. <laughs> sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank yes, you. Sir. Uh, Salah, I can understand that it is very getting late in California. So, can you take some more questions from the attendees? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So, over to Dr. Antara uh, for Q&A session. 
Dr. Antara. Yes, thank you, sir. First of all, I'd like to thank Professor Sarah he mentioned for enlightening us with such an informative talk. Madam, I'm going to read out the questions asked by the participants. So the first question is, above what PGA values should the ground motion be selected for site response studies of deep sites? It's a it's a great question, but I am not an engineer. I have no engineering experience whatsoever. You don't want any answer I have to give about um, figuring out uh, any kind of response, um, be it geotechnical or engineering. Okay, thank you, ma'am. And the next question is, can we use a ground motion prediction equation derived using weak ground motion data for strong motion prediction? I, well, I think that the, I think they can do the, I think we can only do the best that we can, but I think that both ends of the um, ground motion scale are kind of questionable and less certain and less well constrained. Um, what Andy was bringing up earlier is that we actually, we're actually aren't sure that the, you know, the relatively weak motions that, you know, ground motion model is based on, right? The motions that we have absorbed over the age of the digital seismometer is, you know, we, we pick, you know, the strongest motions we've seen, but they may not, you know, reflect the full diversity of even stronger ground motions you might see in really rare earthquakes. But also we haven't really, you know, um, explored our records at the low end. And so we don't know um, if these ground motion models are, are actually accurate for weak shaking either, right? They, they, they really just capture the range of the data that were looked at. And most people have really only been looking in kind of the medium range of shaking. Limited at the top because we simply haven't lived long enough to see the, the really strong ones very often. And limited at the bottom just because I, I think people haven't taken the initiative. Um, there was this famous um, lecture um, by um, Richard Feynman that was called this plenty of room at the bottom. And I think that's probably true for ground motion modeling, right? Those data exist, right? Little earthquakes exist, weak shaking exists. There's plenty of records, but we, we haven't looked at the bottom end. The top end's a little tricky because we just don't have that much data, but we, we are increasingly getting good records and it does sort of, and it does seem to be robust that ground motion saturates for high shaking. So maybe there isn't that much to be seen at the top end. It's very inviting to go look at the bottom. We definitely, that is a wide open field. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, ma'am, last question is, how can we model the spatially varying ground motion? Well, um, there are people who are experts in this who are um, not me, but um, it's my impression, my probably wrong impression because it's not my field, um, is that it's pretty much done the same as modeling peak ground acceleration or peak velocity, right? You use this, and in fact, the NGA uh, West 2 um, modelers um, made um, spectral um, ground motion models in addition to peak ground acceleration and peak ground velocity models. So you, again, you take a database of all the things that you want, you process it to whatever it is you want to try and model in the data, and you fit away. And I'm sure there's a really much more sophisticated answer that could be had if you talk to somebody who actually does that. But I am the person who does math and the person who looks at earthquake ruptures. And neither of those are useful for your question. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, we have time constraints, therefore we cannot proceed for more questions. So thank you, ma'am. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Andara. Thank you, Sala. Uh, now we have reached to the last agenda of IBWGSP's last session, which is vote of thanks. Now may I request Dr. Anessa Dr. Hazorika propose vote of thanks, please. About Dr. Anessa. Thank, thank you, Dr. Shardhanu Borwa, sir. Namaskar and good morning from India to all the dignitaries and esteemed participants who have joined us today from across the world. 
on the final day of the second international virtual workshop on global seismology and tectonics, I, Anvesha Dr. Hazarika, feel honored and proud to propose a vote of thanks and acknowledge the contribution of all those who have helped in making this event a grand success. At the very outset, I convey our gratitude and sincere thanks to our today's speaker of this technical session, Dr. Sarah E. Minson from USGS USA for readily accepting our invitation and delivering such an intriguing lecture today on the topic, Shaking is almost always a surprise, the earthquakes that produce significant ground motion. Thank you, Dr. Minson, for enlightening us with your valuable insights and experiences. It was indeed quite helpful and a great pleasure to listen to you. I would like to extend our profound gratitude to Dr. Shekhar C. Monday, Director General of CSIR and Secretary of DSIR for permitting us to organize this virtual workshop. I also express my sincere thanks and gratitude to Dr. G. Narahari Shastri, Honorable Director of CSIR Nis Jorhat, for always encouraging us and extending his generous support and for providing opportunities to organize this event. On behalf of the CSI NEAST family and the entire organizing committee of IVWGST 2021, I would like to take this opportunity to express our deep regards and gratitude to our chief guest and international advisor of this workshop, Professor Andrew J. Michael from USGS USP, and session advisor, Professor Daping Zhao from Tohoku University, Japan, for sparing their precious time with us and providing unflagging support and constant motivation and valuable suggestions towards this workshop. We are extremely fortunate and grateful to you both, sir. I'd like to take this opportunity to, ex uh, to extend our profuse gratitude and most sincere thanks to our session chairman, Professor Gior Kayal, former Deputy Director General of GSI, and session co-chairman, Dr. Sora Bolwa, Chief Scientist of CSI NAIS, for their valuable presence and for providing kind assistance constant supervision and for helping us to steer the course of this workshop. Once again, a hearty thank you. I convey my gratitude to our advisory members, Dr. Jyotin Kolita, J.L. Khongshai, and Ramashankar Sharma from CSIR NEAST for their valuable support and guidance towards this event. I extend a very hearty vote of, uh, vote of thanks to all the keynote speakers on this forum for gracing your important work and sharing with us your valuable research findings and innovative ideas throughout the course of this workshop. We really enjoyed and learned a lot from all of these educative lectures. It is my pleasure to thank and appreciate the convener of this workshop, Dr. Shantanu Borwa, for his commendable dedication and effort to organize this event and for giving us such an excellent platform for the direct communication and exchange of scientific knowledge with his stalwarts in the domain of global seismology and tectonics. I convey my heartfelt gratitude and sincere thanks to the co-conveners of this workshop, Professor Monoj Kumar Fukon, Group Leader and Senior Scientist of GSTD CSIR NEAST, Professor Sebastiano Di Amico from uh, Malta University, and Professor Bijit Kumar Chaudhary, Senior Scientist of CSIR NEAST, for extending generous support and help in conducting this workshop. I would also wish to express my deep sense of appreciation and thanks to the entire technical team and all the members of the organizing committee of IVW GFC 2021 for their untiring efforts and hard work in successfully organizing this event. My deep sense of appreciation and thanks and a huge round of applause goes to all the attendees from all over the world who attended this workshop with great enthusiasm and cooperation and made this event a great success. I also extend my hearty thanks to all the participants who have contributed e abstracts to the e abstract volume of the second IVW GFT 2021. I'd also like to mention that our next technical session, which was about to be held at 7 p.m. Indian Standard Time, could not be held as our keynote speaker, Professor Justin Rubinstein from USGS USA, will not be able to deliver his talk due to his health issues. So the next technical session has been canceled and we apologize to all of you for that. Uh, finally, I solicit your continued support towards this international workshop on global seismology and tectonics and look forward for your constant encouragement and valuable suggestions. Once again, thank you to all the dignitaries present here and all the participants for glorifying our event by joining us today. Dhanabad. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Dr. Uh, Dr. Sarah, I could 